Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, we will continue with the structure theory of semi-simple algebra. So, I will actually first recap uh, what we have done so far. So, we have actually proved that there are total subalgebras of given semi-simple algebras and then we have fixed one maximal total subalgebra which we denoted by H. So, we fixed a maximal total subalgebra of G. So, we proved that H must be abelian subalgebra and it also consisting of <coughs> semi-simple elements. So, all elements of H are semi-simple elements in G. In particularly, if we take add x where x is coming from this h. So, these are all act uh, semi simply on g, act semi simply on g. So, in particularly we can talk about the root space decomposition of g which is given by g equal to C G of H direct sum direct sum G alpha where alpha coming from phi where this C G of H is nothing but the centralizer of uh, H which is also same as G naught and G alpha is given to be those x in G such that when you act H on x. So, that gives us alpha of H x for all h in h. So, these g alphas when alpha coming from phi they are called root spaces and this decomposition is called root space decomposition. So, in this lecture what we want to do we want to prove that for this maximal total subalgebra the centralizer of this H that is G naught that must be equal to H. So, this is the theorem this H must be equal to C G of H. So, that is same as G naught. There are several steps involved in order to prove this. So, let us uh, do step by step. The step 1 we want to understand what happens to first of all this C G H. So, let us denote C by this C G H which is the centralizer. Our step 1 is actually this C contains the semi simple and nilpotent parts of its elements. So, that is the first observation C contains <coughs> the semi simple and nilpotent parts of its elements. So, what is the meaning of that? So, if we take x in C, we can talk about the abstract Jordan decomposition of this x. So, in particularly x can be written as xs plus xn where xs is the semi simple part and xn is the nilpotent part and we conclude that both xs and xn both are elements of C. So, how one proves this? Recall the definition of C. So, C consisting of all elements of G that actually centralizes H. So, now if we take this x in C, one notice that this add x when you restrict to H that actually maps H to 0. Okay. So, since this add x is given by add x s plus add x n and we know that the usual Jordan decomposition of add x will be this add x s plus add x n. So, in particularly this add x the semi simple part is nothing but add of x s. Similarly, the nilpotent part of add x is nothing but add of x n. So, using our uh, 
usual Jordan decomposition we can see that uh, both this add x s and add x n they are given in terms of polynomials of add x. So, since add x maps h to 0, so that will imply immediately that add x s also maps h to 0 and add x n also maps h to 0 as they are all polynomial in add x with constant of zeros. So, in particularly x s and x n both centralizes h. So, that implies x s x n they are all elements of C. So, now if we take semi simple elements of this C, so they must lie inside h. So, that is again easy to see. So, that is our second observation all semi simple elements of this C they must lie inside your h. So, how one can prove this? So, we take x to be element of C which is semi simple. So, then you know that this x actually centralizes h. So, the bracket h x should be 0. Now, you consider this h dash which is a bigger space h sum this C x. So, now you can easily see that since x is actually commuting with all elements of this h and x is semi simple and all elements of h is also semi simple. So, we get that this h dash is again total subalgebra. So, this is consisting of semi simple elements. So, in particularly this h is contained inside this h dash. So, that forces that this h must be equal to h dash because h is being maximal. So, since h is maximal. So, that means this x must lie inside h. So, that simply proves that all semi simple elements of C must lie inside h. So, now let us restrict our uh, killing form to this uh, h and then see what happens. So, one can prove as we observed. So, when you restrict to this killing form to h this must be non degenerate. So, how one can prove? So, assume that <coughs> the radical if you compute when you for this restriction is actually non zero. So, that means kappa of some h comma h that is 0 for some h in h. So, we must to show that this h must be 0. So, we know that the killing form when we restrict to uh, C that must be non degenerate. So, that is already known. So, what is known? Kappa restricted to this C cross C that is non degenerate because C being equal to G naught. Okay. So, this is something we, you know. So, now you take some x in C, so which is nil potent. Now, look at that this x actually commutes with h. So, that means if I take any element y inside this h, so this bracket x y must be 0. So, that means x and y okay, where y coming from h that will commute. Okay. Since y is being semi simple or x is being nil potent, we can easily see that this x y must be actually or the add x add y that must be nil potent. Okay. So, let y inside h. So, since add x add y they commute and add x is nil potent. So, this implies that add x composition add y. So, this is again nil potent. So, that implies the kappa of this x comma y which is trace of add x add y. So, that must be 0. So, that means the kappa of x comma h is already 0. So, kappa of x comma h is 0. 
So, we already know that all semi simple elements of C they all lie inside H ok. All semi simple elements of C lie inside H. So, that means if we take this kappa of H comma C, so that must be 0 because kappa of any x comma h is 0 for all x nilpotent element for semi simple elements lie inside h. So, in particularly already given that kappa of h comma capital H is 0. So, now if you put together then we can conclude that kappa of h comma c must be 0. So, that implies that h is in the radical of this kappa when you restrict to c but that is already non-degenerate. So, that proves that h must be 0. So, that proves that kappa is actually non-degenerate when we restrict to h. So, now uh, what we will actually prove we indeed want to claim that uh, this c is being equal to h, but you know already that h is abelian, but uh, it is actually take some effort to prove that c is abelian, but it is easy to prove c is actually nilpotent. So, that is what we are going to prove now. So, c is indeed nilpotent subalgebra. So, how one proves this? Again we use Engel's theorem. So, if we take element of this c, if x is in c and if x is semi simple. So, then what happens this x must lie inside h and that implies add x when you restrict it to c. So, that must be 0 ok because x centralizes h and x is in h ok. So, add x restricted to c must be 0. So, on the other hand if we take x to be nilpotent if x is in c and x is nilpotent. So, then you can easily see that add x c must be nilpotent. So, that is the definition. So, indeed what we proved for any given x ok. So, you can write this x as x s plus x n, but we have observed that this add x c must be equal to add x s c plus add x n c. But since x s and x n both are elements of c and for uh, semi simple elements and nilpotent elements we observe that this add x c must be nilpotent. So, that means, so these are two commuting nilpotent operators sum of two commuting nilpotent operators. So, that means this add x must be nilpotent. So, now for each x we proved that add c x must be nilpotent. So, now using the Engel's theorem we conclude that uh, this c must be nilpotent. So, now what we will do? So, we will actually uh, instead of proving c being abelian we first observe that if we take h intersection the bracket c c that must be 0. So, this is our fifth observation we observe that h intersection the bracket c c must be 0. So, we, we are slowly proceeding to actually c being equal to h. So, for that we need to prove c is abelian then later we will use that to prove that c is equal to h. So, why h intersection c c is 0? So, otherwise what will happen uh, you can actually uh, look at what is this h c. So, the h c must be 0 as c being uh, centralizer of h. So, in particularly if we use the associativity of the killing form we can see that the kappa of uh, h comma this c c. So, that must be equal to kappa of h c comma c so which is 0. So, that means the elements of h and the elements of this uh, bracket c c they are orthogonal to each other, but when we restrict kappa to h that must be non-degenerate. So, that means the intersection must be 0 
if this is non zero then that uh, intersection uh, that non zero element which is in the intersection will give a uh, element which is there in the radical of the killing form when we restrict to h which is contradiction so that proves that this intersection must be zero so now we are ready to prove actually c is abelian so let us prove that uh, c is abelian so to prove c is abelian we need to prove that uh, the derived algebra c c must be actually zero so let us assume on the contrary it is non zero so otherwise we get the bracket c c is non zero but this bracket c c this is being ideal inside c and c is nilpotent so that implies the center of c intersection with this cc that must be non zero so that comes from uh, the fact that we proved about uh, nilpotent lie algebras if g is nilpotent i is an ideal inside g then i intersection the center of g must be non zero so that is what we proved so in particularly this must be non zero if we assume this bracket cc is non zero so now you take ez which is non zero element inside this intersection so then note that uh, this ez cannot be semi simple because if ez is semi simple all semi simple elements of c must lie inside h but we already observed that h intersection the bracket cc must be zero so that means ez is not semi simple in particularly its nilpotent part n let's say n that must be non zero okay maybe we'll call it ez ez n so its nilpotent part ez n so this must be non zero so now uh, we already know that this ez n must lie inside c because all its uh, semi simple parts and uh, Uh, nilpotent parts of its elements lie inside c uh, this ez actually centralizes c so add ez c is actually zero so that implies that uh, add ez10 also maps c to zero because add ez10 is being actually nilpotent part of add ez so that implies that uh, add ez10 must be polynomial in add ez with constant term zero so that should uh, imply that add ez10 also maps c to zero so that will imply that this ez10 is also lie inside this center of c but then if you look at our uh, observation what we have seen if x and y commutes and y is nilpotent that implies that xy is also nilpotent in particularly trace of xy is zero so that proves that this kappa of this ez10 comma c so that must be zero because ez10 commutes with all elements of c and ez10 is nilpotent but we already established that this kappa restricted to c must be non degenerate so that implies this ez10 must be zero which is a contradiction this contradiction happened because we assume that this bracket cc is being non zero so that forces that this bracket cc must be zero so that means c is abelian so now we are ready to prove actually c must be equal to h so this is the important fact okay so otherwise what will happen c must contain a non zero nilpotent element okay because all the semi simple elements of c they must lie inside h so if c is not equal to h then that implies <coughs> c must contain non zero nilpotent element so now call that element x so you can see that this kappa of x comma y so which is nothing but the trace of add x add y so this must be zero for all y in c again this actually uses that fact that if x and y commutes y is nilpotent that implies xy is nilpotent 
So, using the same fact we can see that this add x add y commutes and add x is nil potent. So, that implies that kappa of x y is 0 for all y in C, but this is again contradiction uh, to the fact that kappa restricted to C is actually non-degenerate. So, that implies this x must be 0. So, indeed we proved that C contains only semi simple elements, but all semi simple elements of C must lie inside H. So, that proves that C is subset of H. So, that means H equal to C. As an immediate corollary, we can conclude that the restriction of this kappa to H must be non degenerate. So, the restriction of kappa to H must be non-degenerate. So, what is the advantage of uh, this killing form being non-degenerate? So, in particularly one can identify H with H star u via this killing form. So, let us look at this natural map. So, you have a map from H to H star where H star is the home space the dual space of H comma C. Okay. So, what is the map? If we take x then we can send it to uh, kappa of x comma dash. So, note that kappa of x comma dash. So, this is a map from h to c which actually takes y to kappa of x comma y. Since kappa is bilinear, so it is also linear in the second variable. So, this defines will define map from h to h star. So, let us call this map is uh, i. So, it is easy to check. So, I will leave it to you to check this i is indeed indeed C linear map. So, now note that so the kernel of this i okay. So, that will be just a radical of kappa okay. So, if kernel of i if x is in the kernel i if and only if kappa of x comma dash should be 0. So, that means if and only if kappa of x comma y is 0 for all y in H, but we know that there is no element in the radical. So, that means uh, kappa is non-degenerate. So, that implies that the kernel of this i must be 0. So, that means this i is, is indeed injective map, indeed injective map. So, now you can see that H and H star both have same dimension. So, the dimension of H is same as dimension of H star. So, that implies that this I must be an isomorphism, must be an isomorphism. So, that means we can identify H naturally with H star using this map. So, that means given pi inside this H star there exists T pi such that this kappa of T pi comma H is given to be pi of H for all H in H. So, indeed the T pi's are uniquely defined using this equation. So, now for alpha in phi again we have what is called this T alpha. So, you can look at this T alpha where alpha is in phi. So, which is a subset of this H. Okay. So, these again play very important role. So, naturally this has one to one correspondence with uh, phi. Okay. So, these elements or the scalar multiple of these elements will be called core roots. Okay. So, we will come to this later. So, we have actually so for what we have done. So, we have actually started with this uh, root space decomposition and then we proved that the maximal toral subalgebra must be equal to its centralizer. In particularly we have the following root space decomposition g equal to g naught direct sum direct sum g alpha alpha coming from phi where uh, g naught is actually equal to h. So, this can be written as h direct sum direct sum g alpha alpha is in phi. 
So, this g alpha is given to be those x in g such that the bracket h x is given to be alpha of h x for all h in h. So, this is how the root spaces are given for alpha in phi. So, we have this root spaces. and all the elements of phi are called the roots. So, these are called the set of roots. So, we will actually uh, make many observations about this set of roots. So, the set of roots it is actually a combinatorial data that is associated with this g and they are geometrically very much constrained because there is a natural group which is called wild group that will act on this set of roots. So, because of this geometric constraints, uh, we will have lots of restriction uh, for the elements of phi and those restriction in some way allows us to actually classify these set of roots okay? and then we will use this classification uh, in order to classify the finite dimensional semi simple algebras. Okay, I will stop here, uh, I will continue uh, later with the structure 3 of semi simple algebras. Thank you.